Today, I want to talk about my favorite bad movie. I've mentioned it a few times already in my videos, but I always plan to do a more focused analysis of The Kissing Booth, as this movie undoubtedly deserves. And with the sequel right around the corner, I figured there was no better time to talk about why I love this movie the way I do. To me, The Kissing Booth is the definition of So Bad It's Good, which is among the most important film classifications out there. As of this recording, I've seen this movie about 30 times. That may sound deranged to some of you, and you're not wrong to think that, but the fact remains, I just can't get enough of this movie. I love bad movies. Hell, my roommate and I have an almost nightly habit of opening up Netflix and just scrolling to find the weirdest, most algorithmically buried movies we can. And through this magical journey we keep taking, I've seen a lot of insane stuff. Hallmark movies, weird horse girl movies, really weird Christian movies, but very few of them really stick out in my memory because most of them are just bland and boring and telling the same story over and over again. And say what you want about The Kissing Booth, but you cannot call it unoriginal. The thing I love most about this movie is that it feels less like it's trying to be a standard teen drama and more like a parody of that genre because the way it portrays its story is so bizarre. It's truly the Riverdale of movies. It opens with this energetic, super upbeat montage showing the main character growing up with her best friend and then all of a sudden... Found out that my mom was sick. And then the montage just resumes and then... Had a tough talk with dad, sat with mom in the hospital. This is how the movie starts, immediate tonal whiplash, and The Kissing Booth never really stops doing this. The grasp this movie has on tone is loose. Before we get analytical, I'm going to explain the plot of The Kissing Booth, without jokes or commentary, just to give you all an idea of the story if you haven't been lucky enough to see it. Elle Evans and her best friend Lee Flynn are going into their junior year of high school, and Elle is assaulted in the middle of campus, which causes Lee's older brother Noah to start a fight, as he often does. Elle always had a bit of a crush on Noah, but was held back by one of her many friendship rules with Lee, dictating that family members are off-limits for relationships. Elle and Lee decide to run a kissing booth at their school's fundraiser and start recruiting people to work the booth. The person everyone wants most is Noah, who refuses to help. When the fundraiser comes around, Around, the booth is an enormous hit and Elle ends up kissing Noah, which starts a secret romance between them after they have sex under the Hollywood sign a couple days later. Elle and Lee start drifting apart as Lee gets a girlfriend and Elle maintains her secret relationship with Noah. Eventually, the truth gets out, creating a rift between Elle and the brothers, but Elle and Lee eventually reconcile and go to prom as friends. At the prom, a rebuilt kissing booth is revealed and Noah confesses his love for Elle, but she rejects him and he leaves for university. At Ellen Lee's shared birthday party, Elle tells Lee how she really feels about Noah, and Lee gets over it and says they can still catch up to him. As they drive to the airport, it's revealed that Noah didn't leave yet and switched places with Lee in the car, and Elle somehow didn't recognize him. Sorry, I know I said no commentary. Elle and Noah spend the entire summer together, and then Noah leaves for university. The future between them is uncertain. Based on that summary, you might think The Kissing Booth is another Netflix original about a love triangle in high school, but it's so much more. An important detail about the creation of this movie is that it's based on a book, but not in the traditional sense. The Kissing Booth is now a published novel, but its original form was being self-published on Wattpad by the then 15-year-old author Beth Regals. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, good for her. Take that money and run, because I was only 15 when I wrote this is the best excuse to skirt criticism. Can you imagine if that happened to you? A Wattpad novel you posted at 15 gets turned into a Netflix movie with the kind of push this one had? That would be insane. And I can't even blame Beth Regals for the weirder aspects of this movie. Sure, she wrote the book, but the director of this movie wrote the screenplay, and there are definitely things that could have been adjusted while adapting it. Wearing a skirt like that is asking for it. But thank god they weren't, because the chaotic energy the kissing booth exudes in every frame is just so wonderful. This is not a movie based in any form of reality. From a genre standpoint, I'd classify it closer to fantasy than teen drama. Noah and Lee live in this enormous mansion, Lee has this beautiful car, their school is wacky, their parties are huge, it's all so bright and colorful, everyone gets along, and nobody has any real problems. 
problems. Even the school's fundraiser looks like this. How is this not costing more money to run than what they're trying to raise? This movie is very much a polished, candy-coated fantasy about what high school and teenage life is like, but inevitably the drama does seep back in, and it never feels right when it does. Like I said, tone is not this movie's friend. I haven't read the Kissing Booth book for comparison because I'm afraid it won't live up to my personal hype, but I have a feeling this script stayed pretty close to it. One second, it's all light and fun, and there's a montage with some 80s song playing, and then out of nowhere, the movie just slams on the brakes and gets really serious. Okay, maybe not really serious, but at least relatively serious, you know, for the kissing booth. But because these tonal shifts are always so sudden and so surprising, the emotional scenes almost always read as funny because they don't fit with the rest of the movie. <laughs> I'm not saying I wanted some grungy drama about kids suffering from heroin withdrawal or something, but the fact that nothing negative really happens to the characters just makes it funnier when the movie tries to get real. It's like these moments happen out of obligation, like the writer knows the end of Act 2 means everyone has to be sad now, but not how to get there. I like seeing this movie adhering to that story structure, even though everything that happens in it is so insane. It's not like the story beats are David Lynch level or anything, but they just feel off for this kind of movie. Like when Elle and Noah hook up in the school's science lab, and then Elle gets herself sent to the principal's office to steal back the security camera footage. <laughs> Plus the fact that this isn't even its own scene, it's just a slightly focused section of yet another montage. So it's not the craziest thing I've ever seen, but it's still just off. It's not what you would usually see in a Netflix rom-com. Pretty much every scene is like that. Nothing feels convincing in a cinematic sense, and you can never really get invested in any sense of conflict or danger because there isn't any. Good things just happen to these characters, like how Noah gets into Harvard. His character is positioned as the motorcycle riding, leather jacket wearing, fight starting, bad boy meathead, but he still gets accepted to Harvard. I don't start fights, okay? I only finish them. Sure, he has his moments where he's actually sensitive, and I'm sure they're trying to avoid cliches, but it feels more like a 15-year-old girl just picked the first university she thought of when she was writing her Wattpad novel, and that's the kind of energy I love. To be fair, the movie does this with pretty much every character. They change on a whim to serve whatever function they need to in each scene. Maybe that's some sort of statement about the multiplicity of the human psyche, but I, uh... I doubt it. And things never really escalate, either. Once Elle and Noah get together, they have a few close calls, but nothing that ever implies there would be any real consequences to being caught. The only time things go wrong is when the secret gets out and everyone fights, but Elle and Lee's fight is resolved with one round of Dance Dance Revolution, so... But despite all of that, you know what's weird? It's not a terribly made movie all around. It generally looks nice, the actors may not be great, but they're trying and clearly having fun. In terms of visuals and energy, Netflix has done much worse than this, but the direction and the style just strike me as so odd, and the dialogue doesn't help. Just don't end up grinding coochies with my brother, or I'll literally never talk to you again. And I guess that's the key difference between what I would call a bad movie and a so bad it's good movie, because with every weird new wrinkle the kissing booth reveals, I find it more fascinating than annoying. The movie's world is populated with side characters that I am obsessed with, like the OMG girls, a group of three popular girls named Olivia, Mia, and Gwyneth, because OMG. That's so stupid, but I love it. My favorite character in the whole movie is Yearbook Guy. I have a weird love for one-note characters like this who have an oddly specific bit that becomes funny almost by accident. His running joke isn't even that clever, or even a joke, really? He's the guy who takes pictures for the yearbook, and every time something wacky happens, he pulls out his phone and says, Yearbook. Yearbook. Was it really that hard to find a prop DSLR? And then at the prom, all his photos are on display and Lee tells him they look good. So that's... his arc? Why would they even display these at the prom? 
That's what the yearbook is for. Also, none of these pictures look like they were taken by a high schooler with a phone. They look like production stills. There's also this strange little representation touch of this gay couple who never say a single word to each other or interact with anyone else. They just look at each other twice and it has nothing to do with anything. It just feels like they were added in reshoots or something. It's so bizarre. Give one of them a line, at least. And that's the stuff I focus on when I watch The Kissing booth. Those small, weird little flourishes that make this movie feel so unique, even when working with a premise as old and tired as girl starts dating bad boy in secret. So why is it that The Kissing Booth sticks out to me while something like Tall Girl just feels like another generic rom-com? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the main character's role in the love story. Rom-com leads are always missing something, a sense of structure or normalcy, or in the case of every Hallmark movie, the push to give up their career and become a wife or mother. That's what happens in every single Hallmark movie, and it gets funnier every time. But in general, rom-com leads are all about finding stability, about finding the man or woman of their dreams who gives them the life they've been seeking. Elle, on the other hand, goes down a very weird path. The first romantic entanglement she has, apparently the first of her character's entire life, is going on a date with the guy who assaulted her at their school, which was a unique narrative choice. Then, it's revealed that Noah has been threatening all the guys at their school to not date Elle, even though he's not dating Elle, or, or trying to, and he's generally very creepy and possessive. The days of you controlling my life are over! We'll see about that. And then Elle and Noah start dating, and I'm supposed to be rooting for this. It's not like Noah really does anything for her, or their relationship changes her at all. Well, actually, it's kinda hard to tell because their relationship mostly plays out in endless montages. And yeah, her friendship with Lee becomes strained and they fight, but again, one round of Dance Dance Revolution and they're best friends again, so why should I care? What are Elle's characteristics? What does she like to do besides sit near pool and play soccer? I have no idea. The movie never even commits to the idea of a love triangle, because Lee gets a girlfriend pretty early on in the story and their relationship is just perfect until the end. That character has a name, it's Rachel, but she might as well not. But despite that, Lee also acts kind of weird towards Elle, there's that same possessive energy. Since when do you have a lock on your phone? Ah, yes, a very normal thing to say to your best friend. When Elle and Noah's relationship is revealed, Lee gets really angry, and you think there's gonna be this twist where it turns out that he loved Elle the whole time because the movie kind of teased that early on, and instead he says this. You know, my whole life, Noah has gotten everything that he has ever wanted. The only thing that I had that he didn't was you, and now he has that too. So, both of these guys are just entitled weirdos, and I think if most people heard a friend say that, they would probably think, Oh wow, I've misjudged our friendship, I will now be moving on with my life. But no, everything gets resolved, and they're all friends and in love, and Elle never follows up on how Noah was being a weird, controlling freak most of the time. But to be fair, he's tall, so... You may also be wondering how much the titular kissing booth actually factors into this movie, and the answer is much more than it needs to. The first time I watched this movie, I thought the booth would appear in the climax, but it shows up about half an hour in and actually gets the plot moving, or at least what this movie calls a plot, and you figure, okay, that's why the movie's called that. I got it. But then, the booth reappears at the prom, and everyone applauds when they see it because I guess the booth had a profound effect on every single one of them? And then, the very last line of the movie is this. Because all this happened just because of a kissing booth. And technically yes, but Noah was still being weird and manipulative before the booth even came up. I feel like this all would have happened either way. Actually. Now that I think about it, Noah refused to work the booth, but still showed up there just in time for Elle to be brought out. Even with the 15 or so things that happened to get them both there, that's still a pretty big coincidence. But maybe... Maybe it wasn't a coincidence. Maybe the kissing booth just accelerated Noah's timeline. Maybe the booth was all part of his plan. 
Maybe he psychologically fed the idea of a kissing booth to Lee for months so that when the time came, they'd build one and he could finally enact his plan. Maybe he orchestrated all of this, the assault, the date going wrong, to push Elle away from the competition. And then there's the party he throws at his house where Elle drinks too much and passes out so he can take care of her. Awfully convenient. Did we ever see who poured all those drinks? The arguments, the fights, the revelations of deeper emotion. Noah did all of this to craft an image of himself in Elle's mind as angry and flawed, but still sensitive and loving. All to make Elle fall in love with him, because look how enormous he is in comparison to her. He towers over her. He could break her neck as easily as opening a banana. He could snap any time. He's terrifying. The only way to truly seduce her was to use her own creation against her, making her believe it all happened by chance. The kissing booth is a pillar of emotional corruption, a symbol of intimacy turned into currency, much like how romantic comedies package the emotions we long to feel into digestible portions of catharsis so we too believe that one day someone will love us. The Kissing Booth isn't a movie, it's a reflection of humanity's darkest impulses. Our society is the booth. Or maybe it's just badly written, it could be that. In a way, though, I kind of admire that this movie, for all of its wackiness, avoids most tropes and cliches of teen rom-coms. I mean, some cliches are definitely there. Elle has a dead mom, Noah's the bad boy, you've got your usual high school character archetypes. But then they'll throw in a weird curveball, like this girl. I'm British, you wanker. Oh my god, I just remembered. I also went to high school with one British person. James, are you are you watching this? Are you still out there? Are you dead? And stuff like that is what keeps me loving this movie. The very original weirdness. The kissing booth is put together in such a distinctly weird way. There are so many montages, way too many montages for one movie. And maybe the strangest part of all, the end credits contain not only bloopers, but also just deleted scenes. Now you can take Mr. Stinks a lot to baseball practice. Oh, stink that bad. <laughs> I don't know why this struck me as so weird, but I'd never seen that before, and I've only seen it one time since. That was in the Tim Allen, Kirstie Alley vehicle for Richer or Poorer, which I highly recommend if you're looking for a reason to hate the 90s. Either way, I love that I got a few extra morsels of the kissing booth, even after it was over. And who knows, maybe one day Netflix will respond to my emails about releasing an extended cut on Blu-ray. They're sitting on gold. Overall, there are a lot of reasons to love this movie, but one of the biggest is that I just can't tell what it's going for. My biggest grievance with the modern crop of Netflix originals is that all of them feel so bland and inoffensive, and very few of them actually stand out or do something new. So, when I watch something like The Kissing Booth, I can't help but wonder if it's supposed to be another simple, palatable teen drama, because it's not. It's too insane to be that. You can't seriously tell me that Yearbook Guy would fit with the cast of To All the Boys. These movies are fundamentally different. And I will fight you if you disagree. But I'm so glad The Kissing Booth exists as it does, as this whirlwind of craziness that I find new ways to love every time I watch it. Sure, that enjoyment is purely ironic, but it's still enjoyment. Because, as silly as this movie is, I'm legitimately excited for the sequel. I want to see where these characters go, where the story goes. What's going to happen with Elle and Noah, with Lee and Lee's girlfriend? Will the OMG girls find love? Will Yearbook Guy be there? God, I hope so. I love Yearbook Guy so much. All of these questions and more will be answered in The Kissing Booth 2, which I hope is every bit as crazy and nonsensical as the first one. And even if it isn't, I think I'll always come back to this movie for comfort, because I love it. It's my favorite bad movie. It never gets old. And if you haven't seen it yet, or you wrote it off as another boring Netflix rom-com, give it a shot. It might surprise you. So guys, those are my thoughts on The Kissing Booth, aka the most important movie ever made, and I will be covering the sequel as soon as possible. Thanks very much for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, feel free to leave a like and subscribe for more. I'll see you next time.